Hello again. Today's lecture will begin where we ended on the last note. Um, I'm very much aware that problem eight was truncated in the last video. So we're going to start by going over uh, problem eight in the OpenStax textbook. But before we begin, just a quick review of Young's double slit experiment. Uh, the basic idea is that if light is incident as a wave on two very narrow slits that are not too far from each other, then two things will happen. First of all, light is going to diffract from each of the slits. So we will we'll have a, a set of wavelets that will propagate from source S1 and source S2. And these waves will then pass over each other and interfere constructively and distractively. And the end result is that you obtain a set of fringes, which is normally described as an interference fringe pattern, as follows. So suppose that this here is the slit assembly. So this is one slit and this is the second slit. Let's call them slit S1 and slit S2. And let's imagine that the ray of light were to impinge on this slit surface. But of course the ray is actually a wave. Light is a wave. So these wave fronts come and are then incident on the slits. Like we discussed last time, the slit itself becomes a source of wavelets that propagate forward with the same wavelength as the incoming wave with the same speed of light. So from here, we shall draw these semicircular wave fronts that represent the wavelets that are propagating outwards from slit S1, as if slit S1 were the new source of waves. And we can draw as many as possible, but I think this is we have enough. And then from S2, we're going to have a similar set of waves that go out from S2 as if S2 were the source of new wavelengths. And as you can very well see, these waves will just pass over each other. And wherever a crest meets a crest, like here, and there, and there, and so on, we shall have constructive interference. And if I, if I had drawn this properly, you would see that all of this will be very nicely laid out. Okay, um, so if you were to put a viewing screen somewhere here, certain distance away from the slit assembly, this is what you would see. Let's draw the midline that we call theta equal zero degrees. So if you, have, if you have your screen here, then in this portion of the screen where you'd expect not to see anything because it's right exactly in the shadow of the cart of the light that's coming in. Well, this is where you see the brightest fringe. And that's a result of constructive interference between the waves from S1 and S2. And adjacent to the central maximum will be this will be called the first order, first order fringe, and then the second order fringe. And this goes on, and the third order fringe, and the fourth order, and so on. Let's just stop here. We can draw some more. And of course, in between these bright fringes are these dark fringes where the two waves destructively interfere, so they cancel each other out, so there's nothing. And we would call the central maximum the zeroth order, or m equal to zero, the first one, m equal to one, and so on. This is m equal to two, m equal to three, m equal to one, similarly on the other side, because it's symmetric, and so on. And when we wrote out our equation, we said the following. Suppose you draw a line from the midpoint between the slits 
to the midpoint of let's just take the second order frame as an example. Then if I draw this line here, then this is the angle that we shall call theta that corresponds to the n equal to 2 order. And then we can then write d sine theta is m lambda. And this is true for the bright fringes, which are also described as a constructive. They came out of constructive inference. And they also described as the maxima. So these are the different ways that you would see these described. But if the path difference d sine theta were to equal m plus one half of lambda, then these will give you the dark or the destructive interference point or the minima. So if you're given a problem on Young's double slit experiment, then you can see that there are these four elements. There's D, there's theta, there's M, there's lambda. And you recall that M takes on the values 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Just whole number counters. Okay? And you have 1, 2, 3, and 4 elements. So given a problem, you're likely going to be given three of these, and the question will say, find the last one, find the fourth. So these are pretty straightforward uh, problems. I want to make a general comment about the brightness of these fringes. They are not equally bright. The central fringe is the most, uh, it's the brightest, but the other ones are somewhat less bright. So here's an example. If I'm going to redraw this, horizontally. This will be the central maximum. This will be the first. This is the second. This is the third. And on the other side, this is the first, second, and third, and fourth, and so on. So the intensity is greatest for the central maximum. So if we were to draw a graph of the brightness as a function of space, then we would draw something like this. We'll start right and come down and will be essentially zero dark. And then we'll go up again in intensity. But this time the intensity is not quite as high as the central maximum. It goes down again. And this is not quite as high. So you get the idea. So the intensity decays as you go away from the central portion. And so as you go further and further away from the central maximum, the brightness keeps decaying until essentially you don't see um, very much anymore. So for the bright fringes, we shall describe this as m equal to 0, and this is 1, m equal to 2, I'm saying this to make the following point. Look, this here, since this is the central maximum, this is the very first dark fringe. This is the location of the very first dark fringe. First dark fringe. Now, to get the first dark fringe, we will put m equal to 0 in the second equation, the equation for the dark fringes. So m will be 0, i.e. the path difference will be just 1 half of the wavelength, lambda over 2. The next one with, with m equal to 1, the second dark fringe will be m equal to 1, which will give us 3, half, three halves of the wavelength. So for this, we will have m equal to 0. And for the second one, m will be 1. And for the third, m equal to 2, and so on. So I'm just saying. Use your M's carefully, okay? Do not, you do not mix them up. M equal to 1 is for the bright fringe, but for the very fast dark fringe, M will be 0. Okay. 
All right. Now that we have this out of the way, we can. Um, well, I just I'm going to make another comment before we proceed. For Young's double slit experiment to work, you need to satisfy two conditions. Three, maybe, but I want to focus on the first two because we've made the point several times that the wavelength has to be about comparable to the size of the aperture, not much uh, different. Anyway, so the first thing is that the two waves that are interfering must have the same wavelength. Otherwise, you're not going to get an interference pattern. And of course, this condition is satisfied because here, the waves that propagate from S1 and S2 come from the same original wave. It's the wave front that arrives that then splits up into wave S1 and S2. So the wavelength is the same for the interfering waves. The second condition is that the waves must be coherent. Let me explain this. This is what coherence means. Consider the wave that propagates from S1. Let's draw it as a sine wave. Let's draw a few of these. And the wave that propagates from slit S2. Suppose that we, for the case that we're describing, it's exactly in phase with the wave from S1. They're right on top of each other. So this is an example of what you would describe as coherence. These two um, waves have the property that they are coherent. Okay? Let's call this A. In case B, let's draw the wave from S1 as though it's a few sine waves. Let's draw the wave from S2. This is the most general case, okay? Assuming that the waves were not exactly in phase. But if they maintain the same phase relationship, so they are not right on top of each other, but they maintain the same phase difference as the waves propagate. This here is coherent and will give us an interference pattern. This last case here that I'm going to describe is one in which the two waves are slightly, they have slightly different wavelengths. The wavelengths are not that different, but they're not the same. So if you draw one like this, let's draw the second one so that its wavelength is not that different. So, and it starts off looking like the, the two are in phase, but because the wavelength differs, you can see that very soon, you're going to end up, if we keep drawing this, then we're going to, even though we started with waves that appear to be right on top of each other and therefore will interfere constructively, very soon we're going to end up with a destructive interference. You can see that uh, the minimum is about occurring at the same time as the maximum, which, which means that cancellation is going to happen. So instead of a constructive interference, you're going to get destructive interference here. So on average, you will not see an interference pattern. This is incoherent. This is two sources that are incoherent. And you will not get an interference pattern from this. And this is typically what you'll get from ordinary light. Because um, when, the, when light is being emitted, the various photons are not talking to each other, essentially. So you're going to end up with something like this. And so Young's double slit experiment is very well done with lasers using very simple single wavelength lasers okay well having made this point let's go on to um, problem eight and once again you recall that problem eight came from page 1099 of the open stacks textbook The question was as follows. It says, what is the separation between two slits? What is the separation between two slits 
for which 610 nanometer orange light? For which 610 nanometer orange light has its first maximum at an angle of 30 degrees. Has its first maximum at an angle of 30.0 degrees. Okay, what is the separation between the two slits? That means we've been asked to find D. For which 610 nanometer orange light, so our wavelength is 610 nanometers, has its first maximum, the first maximum at an angle of 30 degrees. Please do not uh, think that the first maximum refers to the central maximum. No, remember that the central maximum occurs at an angle of zero degrees, the central maximum. So this here is describing the first order, and it says that the first order occurs at an angle of 30, de um, 30 degrees. So we, we have m equal to 1, and our angle theta is 30.0 degrees. And since we are working with a maximum, the appropriate equation is d sine theta is m lambda, because that's the equation for the maxima, the bright fringes. And we're supposed to find d. So we just put in the numbers and we find D. So we have D sine of 30 degrees is 1 times 610. Do not forget to convert from nanometers to SI units, 10 to the negative 9. And so we then solve for D. So D will solve as 610, 10 to the negative 9, divided by sine of 30 degrees is 0 0.5 i've told you this multiple times so this is one half and so this becomes two times 610 10 to the negative nine which gives us 12 20 10 to the negative nine which is 1.22 10 to the negative six or 1.22 microns, okay? So uh, these problems are straightforward. You gotta be careful. Make sure that all your units are in SI units and just be careful. Make sure that your calculator is in the degree mode so that you get the right answers. If your calculator has for some reason been set to the radiant mode, then you're not gonna get the right answers. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna do another problem, then we can move on to discuss the dispersion of light. So let's do a second problem uh, in which we're asked to find not the maximum, but the minimum. And an example is question 10, which says calculate the wavelength of light that has its third minimum, calculate the wavelength of light that has its third minimum. At an angle of 30 degrees, when fallen on double, double slits that are separated by three microns. When, when fallen on double slits separated by 3.00 microns. Calculate the wavelength. So obviously we do not know the wavelength. This is what we're going to try to find. 
of light that has its third minimum. We are working with the minima. So in the diagram that I just erased, the third minima will occur when m is 2. With the third minimum. Okay, because if you set 2 into the equation, then you get the third minimum. Okay? And the angle, once again, the angle is not always going to be 30 degrees, by the way. So these two problems, for some reason, we use 30.2 degrees. Um, and the slit separation, which is little d, is 3.00 micron is 10 to the negative 6 meters, you recall. So in this case, they are property equation because we are dealing with a minimum, a minimum, the property equation is d sine theta. This is the path difference should be the same as m plus one half lambda. I'm going to do this one more time. When you set m equal to zero, you get the first minimum. m equal to one, you get the second. So m equal to two, you get the third. So our m is two. So we put in the numbers now, we get 3.00 10 to the negative 6 times sine of 30 degrees is the same as 2 plus 1 half times lambda, which is what we're supposed to calculate. 2 plus 1 half, let's write this as 2.5 lambda. And then we solve this for lambda. So lambda is then, so we're going to divide both sides by 2.5. Recall that sine 30 degrees is 0 0.5 itself. So this is 3.00 10 to the negative 6 times 0 0.5. And then we're going to divide this by 2.5. And once again, you can get your calculator, but let's see. 3 times 0 0.5, this is 1 half of 3, so that should give us 1.5, 10 to the negative 6, divided by 2.5. 1.5 divided by 2.5 is 0 0.6, right? 3 fifths, 0 0.6. So this here becomes 6, 10 to the negative 7 meters, or 600 I'm going to do something that will help you solve um, more problems with, a, with an equation that is a, a little bit easier. For the, we're going to write the path difference in a slightly different way. And we're going to use the small angle approximation. And we can show this in uh, one of two ways, but I'm going to adopt the following argument. Suppose that you have a triangle, a right angle triangle, right? This is the right angle. This is what you would call the opposite. This is the adjacent side. And this here is your hypotenuse. In other words, we're describing this angle theta here. So this is opposite to the angle. This is adjacent to the angle. And this is the hypotenuse. Sine theta is defined, of course, as our opposite side divided by the hypotenuse. Tangent theta is the opposite divided by the adjacent side. Notice that the sine theta function and the tangent theta function both have the same opposite on the top, okay? We differ only in the denominator. But consider the case where this angle theta is very, very small, so that I'm gonna draw one that's which is very, so let's draw, let me draw this. So let's say this is the adjacent side. So this is the hypotenuse. This is our opposite. So as you can see, for very small angles, the length of the hypotenuse is not that different from the length of the adjacent side. So for very small angles only, and this is true only for very small angles, 
for small theta, the hypotenuse is approximately the same length as the adjacent, which means that the denominators of these two functions are about the same. Emphasis on small. For small angles only, sine theta is then approximately the same as tangent theta, which means that the path difference d sine theta can often be written simply as d tangent theta. And you will see why this is helpful um, in a minute. So for Young's double slit experiment, this is slit one, S1, slit S2, this is the midline. This is our viewing screen. Let's pick any fringe and say that this is the angle theta. But now we're going to consider the case where the angle theta is very small. So this is D. The distance between the slit assembly, this is what we call a slit assembly. This is what holds the two slits. This is the screen on which we view the fringe pattern. The distance between these two is typically represented as L. This distance, let's call Y. Then for very small angles, tangent theta, we're going to approximate sine theta to tangent theta. But tangent theta, as you can see, is just Y opposite of our adjacent. Tangent theta is simply Y divided by L. So for small angles, we can write the following. Instead of writing d sine theta, we shall write d tangent theta. And so we shall write dy over l is m lambda. And this is true for the bright fringes. And we can also write dy over l is m plus 1 half lambda. And this is for the dark fringes. And this. And once again, m takes on the values 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So this is a, a very good equation that helps us solve problems without actually having to calculate um, the angles theta. So um, just a quick example from homework 10. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to give you some ideas on, on this. Uh, in this case, so this is the homework that has been posted on Quest, homework 10, question 4. And a laser beam of wavelength, so the wavelength is given um, in this example, it is 540.1 nanometers. It's incident on two slits that are 0.12 millimeters apart. That's our D. How far apart are the bright fringes on a screen that is 3.59 meters away? So L here is 3.59 meters. So if this here is the fringe pattern, that well, this here is the see this is the bright fringe. This is the first order, and so on. So the distance from the midpoint of the first order to the central, this is the distance that has been described as y. And this is the typical separation of the fringes on the viewing screen. So this question is simply saying, what is y? What is y? So. What is y? Well, since we are working with the first fringe, m is 1. It's going to be the same for the rest of them. But So our m is 1. And because we are working with the bright, our equation becomes dy over l will be m lambda, or simply lambda because m is and then you proceed to find y. 
So y is lambda L divided by P. And then you plug in these numbers. I'm not going to do that. But you plug in these numbers and you should get the correct answer. Okay. So I believe that with this discussion, you can do the rest of the problems, except, of course, for the one, one question that is on single slit, Young's single slit experiment, which we shall discuss in detail in the next lecture. Um, I'm going to discuss one other aspect of the fact that light, be, light is a wave phenomenon. And that is <laughs> the dispersion of light. Light from the sun, what we normally call white light, turns out it's actually composed of seven different colors. Everybody knows this, right? The colors are red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And I have written them out in this form because I want to emphasize that this end here, this is the short wavelength side. This is the long wavelength side. So that this is the direction of increasing wavelength. Now, everybody also knows that light travels at 3 tenths of the 8 meters per second in vacuum. In an in vacuum, all these component wavelengths of light travel at the same speed, 3 tenths to the 8 meters per second. Let's make that point. And this is true only in vacuum. In vacuum, each component color or each wavelength You could say all color, because the wavelength and the color are just about the same thing. Each wavelength travels at C, 3 tenths of the 8. If you want to be more precise, 2.997925458 or whatever, anyway. But this is not true when light travels in a transparent medium that is not vacuum. When light travels through glass, if you recall in chapter 24, we made the point that light slows down when it travels through glass. And that's why we introduced the concept of an index of refraction. So in a transparent medium, these colors do not travel at the same speed. They don't, first of all, they don't travel at three times a day, but more than that, each of them travels at a different speed. And red has the fastest speed. And violet light has the slowest. So this is the direction of increasing speed. The index of refraction, you, you recall, is n given by the speed of light in vacuum, 3 tenths to the 8 meters per second, divided by the speed of light in the medium. Because red light has a different speed from violet light or blue light, we can write a separate index of refraction for red light for every one of these. But let's do it for blue as well. And then this becomes 3 10 to the 8 divided by V of blue. I don't want to write write it for the case of the violet because then I'll have to write V sub V and it might be a bit confusing. Let's just do the argument with blue light. Now the point is that 
red light is faster than blue light. So in these expressions, the denominators are not the same. And since VR is larger, we expect that NR will be smaller. So the index of refraction of red light is less than the index of refraction of blue light. And therefore, and that's also less than violet light. As a matter of fact, if you draw a graph of the index of refraction versus wavelength, uh, for visible light, we would go from about 400 nanometers to maybe 700 nanometers. Then if this is 1.4, this is 1.5, we find that for 700 nanometer light, it's not that different than 1.5. But for 400 nanometers, it's about 1.52. It's about here. So the curve, if you draw this curve, will give you something like that. Okay, this is how the index of refraction behaves as a function of wavelength. This has some very important consequences, and we will demonstrate this quickly and give one or two examples of what happens when light is refracted. So consider this, this case here. Suppose that I have a piece of glass a good example would be um, crown glass. Suppose that you have light incident in air onto the glass boundary, the inner base, like so. And as we did in an er earlier chapter, what we do is that we erect a normal at the point of incidence and we describe all our angles with respect to the normal. If light had not encountered a different medium, then it would have just simply continued propagating along this original path. But it did. So Snell's law applies. And so we shall write N1. Let's set medium one as the A, and so that this will be our theta one, okay? So we shall write N one sine of theta one equals N two sine theta two and so on. But now, given that the in index of refraction is different for blue and for red, we can actually write this in detail, and we can write N for R sine theta R, and N for blue sine theta blue. And you can do this for any other color. Now the point is that, consider this portion here, this portion here. We're dealing with an equal sign which says that everything here is the same as everything here. Whatever magnitude this is, this must be the same. But NR is smaller than NB. So for these two to be, to be equal, theta R must be larger than theta B. Remember that the angles are measured with respect to the normal. So theta r must be a larger angle. So a larger angle means this is the red. The blue is a smaller angle. So this is the blue. Small angle than the red. So simply by refraction of light, we have separated white light into its component colors. This is the phenomenon of dispersion. So dispersion is the spreading of light or the decomposition of light or the breakup of light, whichever word you want to use. Is the spreading of light I don't like spreading because you might confuse that with diffraction where it spreads into the shadow region. So you can say the breakup of light, the uh, decomposition of light into its component colors. Technically speaking, diffract, uh, sorry, dispersion means that the speed of the phenomenon, the speed of the wave, is wavelength dependent. 
of frequency dependent equivalent. Okay, good. This is this is fine for college physics. All right. So now, in fact, you can see a more impressive dispersion when light goes into a prism. So let's say this is the incident ray. Oh, I'm, let me let me back up for a second. Give you a way to remember this. You see that the blue bent more away from the original path than the red. So a good way to remember this is to say that blue bends best. B B B. Okay. All right. So here we are. We're incident on. This is glass, a glass prism, this is air. So we draw our 90 degree a normal. And then the red bends away from the original path, but blue bends more. Here's the blue. And then when we come out here, blue bends even more. And the red bends as well. And so by the time you're here, you put a viewing screen here, you have a very large separation of the colors. Uh, this is the red and this is the blue and of course this is the indigo and violet and in between is orange and yellow and green. Okay. A very impressive display of dispersion is what what happens with a rainbow. And when we describe that that should be the end of our discussion today. So let's see how a rainbow forms. The rainbow forms simply as a result of dispersion that occurs when light is refracted inside a droplet of water. When it's raining and you have all these very fine droplets that are uh, suspended in the upper atmosphere or somewhere in the atmosphere. Okay. Um, and then when the light is refracted in the droplets, it's also totally internally reflected. You would see this from, from this draw. Of course, please consult a textbook for a finer drawing. So I'll, make, I'll do my best here. So imagine that here's a ray of light coming in from the sun. So this is from the sun. And so we have these parallel rays coming from the sun. And at this point here, everything that we've described here is going to happen. So the blue bends best. So blue bends. Totally internally reflects. Okay, and comes out. The red, not so much. If I had a ruler, I would do a better job. But just follow me. So let's indicate the direction of travel of these two rays. Okay. Um, on the bottom droplet, we have once again the blue. Totally internally reflects on this point here. Comes out here. And the red does what it did up here. Doesn't bend as much. And it comes out here. Okay. So let's draw this properly. Okay. I'm sorry, but I, I should be doing this with a ruler. <laughs> but anyway, the point is that if you set your eye here, then your eye intercepts the red and the blue, or better yet, the violet. But your brain thinks that your brain makes your eye attempt to see the light from here. So I said the light originated from somewhere here. So you see the red way up here in the sky, and the violet and way up down here. So you see the colors of the rainbow, red here and violet down here. Okay. 
and in between you see the, the other components of light. So, in order to see a rainbow, the sun must be from behind you. Hmm? Like this, the sun must be behind you. Okay? There must be water droplets in the atmosphere, and the light must do two things. The light must refract and then totally internally reflect, and then it comes out. And when it comes out, it refracts again, and you, you get even a, a better dispersion. So this is a very impressive example of the dispersion of light. And you can do this very simple experiment where you go out into your yard, get a hose connected to your tap, spray a fine mist of water droplets in the, in the air, the stand so that the sun is behind you, and you, you can make your own rainbow. Okay? All right. So with this, we will end today's lecture, and the next lecture will discuss Young's single slit experiment. And after this, we should, we should be able to discuss Einstein's special theory of relativity.